Thank you, Tom and Caleb. Um, as I mentioned, I want us to talk about the notion of being in the presence of God. Often in, in the Christmas season, uh, we hear the word Emmanuel tossed around. And when the angel first appeared to Joseph in a dream, uh, he learned that his uh, fiance, Mary, was with child through the Holy Spirit, was going to give birth to a son, and they were going to call his name Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 118 and verse 23. And Emmanuel is a Hebrew word that means God with us. So from the very beginning of the life of Christ as an incarnate Savior, his name was God with us. Um, then we have all kinds of things that we're told about what it means to have God with us. In Romans chapter 8 it says, if God can be with us, what? Who can be against us? Right. Uh, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never, what? Leave you or forsake you. We have known that, Hebrews 13, 5. We have known, we have been assured, we have been reminded that if we are servants of His, even as Tom prayed today, that it can be good enough that as long as we acknowledge His presence and are trying to be receptive and obedient to Him, He will always be there for us. He will never leave us. An interesting passage, uh, this morning in Bible class, Tom was talking about uh, the day of judgment and what that's going to be like. And will there be a uh, will he sit behind a bench? He's going to act like a judge. And are we going to have people who's going to represent us and all that sort of thing? <coughs> what we're told in Revelation is, which is one of the two primary passages that we have to see the judgment, the other in Matthew 25, we're told that there's going to be this book of life. It's going to be opened up. And the things written in the book are going to determine the judgment that is rendered. One of the things you're going to look for is to go look for your name in the book of life. And I got to thinking about it this morning. I guess that would be alphabetized to make it quicker. <coughs> um, but that's what's going to happen. And Revelation tells us that. But what we see in Revelation is what John saw in a vision. So we don't know whether literally we're supposed to take that picture of the, of the judgment or not. Sort of like this passage. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And again, we're talking about a picture of eternity. It says that there is going to be a tabernacle of God. And the word tabernacle carries with it so many rich meanings particularly what everything we know about what the Old Testament says about what they did and why they had it and why it was so revered by them because that was where they believed that they were in the presence of God. But in this particular instance, John says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and He's going to dwell with them. God Himself will be with them. What does that tell us? Have you stopped to think about it? Now, I think it's real easy for you and me. Let me take that back. I think it's real easy for me to think about heaven and the presence of Christ. Because I've got enough pictures to know what he looks like, and I think I'll recognize him. But we're told that God's going to be with us there. And he's going to be our God. We're going to be in his presence. And there are so many examples in the Scripture, and it's been hard to narrow it down to a handful and then cut them short enough to get all this in so we can eat. But some really important Old Testament examples of the presence of God. None of these are going to be new to you. Because what we're going to see are some examples of how God was with us. Or in this case, with them. The first one we would mention is Abraham, uh, or Abram, uh, 1 Kings, 
we find in, in uh, we find that there were four kings that went up against five kings. And they were going to go to battle. And, and the five kings, in fear, ran off. And in so doing, Lot and his household and all of his possessions were taken captive. And we find out the instruction that is given to Abram that he's supposed to go and rescue him. All of these things, the word of the Lord, came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. What's he saying? Abram, go rescue Lot. I'm going to be there. Think about the mental picture of God saying, I am your shield as you're going into battle. Can you think of anything better? Another example might be that one of Joseph. We know the story about Joseph, how he's betrayed by his brothers and they take his coat and they, you know, they divvy it up and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> and we find out that even though he is betrayed, Genesis 39 says the Lord was with Joseph. Because when he was carried off into Egypt, he was made a successful man in the house of the master of the Egyptian. And we know how kind of that all played out. You remember that lady, Potiphar's wife, who what, tried to seduce him, and he would have none of it? And so she concocts a story that says that he was involved in immorality toward her, and they stick him in prison. But Genesis tells us that the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, and he was once again elevated back into the household. Why does this happen? Well, even when bad things happen to him, even when he gets stuck in prison for a second time, God's still with him. And we are told to notice that. A third example might be that of Moses. Remember what was said in the burning bush? Moses, I've got a job for you. You need to go to Pharaoh and tell him to release my people. Remember Moses' excuse? Uh, Lord, who am I that I should go to Moses? And then he goes on to offer several more excuses. But then one thing that he forgot, because in chapter 3, verse 12, God goes on to say, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. He said, I'm going to make sure that the people know that I was with you because I don't want them to think you did this. God was with Moses. And I'm convinced there's no way that Pharaoh releases the Egyptians without the demonstrations of the powers of God that was given to Moses. <coughs> then we might also talk about Joshua. You remember they get to the promised land and it didn't work out for them first trip. And so they have this whole generation almost that dies in the wilderness and they get back to the promised land again. And Joshua is given the charge that they're supposed to go over the Jordan and to take the land of Canaan. And Joshua is told that no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you also. I will not leave you nor forsake you. God assured him. He thought about how Joshua recognized that God was with him when they went. You remember that whole river drying up thing so they were able to cross on dry land? Remember earlier the example he'd given to Moses when the Red Sea kind of separated and they went across on dry land? The presence of God. It's easy to see. The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. He wanted them to understand that they were acting on the power and command of God. And one of my absolute favorite, not just Old Testament stories, but the entire Bible stories, when Israel is opposed by the Midianites and completely outnumbered and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. 
I have this mental picture of Gideon looking around to see who had entered when the mighty man of valor was mentioned. He was. Why? Because God was with him. And the Lord's presence is what gave him the courage and the ability to do what he was supposed to do. And then every child that's ever been in a children's Bible class could tell us about the story of David and Goliath, the shepherd boy, facing the tremendous giant. So what we have is a physical giant and we have a spiritual giant going up against one another. And the difference is, he was instructed, go, the Lord will be with you. David was supposed to go. And isn't it a fact that you and I have instructed that we're supposed to go and that God is going to be with us? Because we can talk about, even as a youth, you know, when Jeremiah says, I, I cannot speak for them because I am youth. Best estimates, 17 to 20 years old. And Jeremiah is given the commission to go and be a prophet. And he tries to use his own level of excuses that didn't work for him. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, he was told by the Lord. And so the Lord said, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of the work that I have given you. I will be with you. I will deliver you to go forward. <clears throat> How many times do we see in the Old Testament the phrase, I will be with you. Go do what I've told you to do. The assurance that they have been given of being successful is what God wants us to do. Over and over again, when he says, I will be with you, it is because he wants us to know we can accomplish what he has told us. And when he says, I will be with you, the Lord is with us. And so we ought not to be fearful. It's not something that should keep us from trying to do what he told us to do. If you're ever afraid, slash ashamed, slash worried to go and say what needs to be said, do it with love in your heart and know that someone has your back. And the Lord is going to give us the same level of victory that He has always given. I will be with you. Now, there are a number of applications that I suppose we could make. But let's break down this one. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus gave what we refer to as the Great Commission. He says, go. And then He says, go and teach all nations. And then he says, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that phrase that we don't emphasize as much as what's on the screen is this one. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go teach, baptize, and teach them. And oh, by the way, you're not going by yourself. I would suggest to you that just about every endeavor that we undertake to either decide that we want to become a Christian or once we have become a Christian, what we need to do. And if we do that as a young person, the challenges that we have that come naturally with being young and all the influences, or if we be a midlife person, all the challenges that come with being in midlife, as Tom mentioned in the prayer, those of us who were old, sick, and decrepit, <laughs> those are all challenges for us. And, and then the challenges that come with being elderly. You know, I don't feel like I can do anything anymore. God has works for us to perform that we're capable of doing. And we need to keep watching for them. Because think about this example. Who were these 12 guys? I will tell you that I'm pretty sure, looking at the resume of these 12, I wouldn't have hired any of them. Eddie, these wouldn't have been your cabinet members. That wasn't the kind of bunch that you were going to surround yourself. They were described as being unlearned Galileans. Chapter 4, verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained. 
And yet they marveled. They realized what? They had been in the presence of God. They had been with Christ. And as a result of that, it made them up to the task. Why? Because they knew what Christ had said. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so when we find Paul trying to convince people that if I can do it, you can do it, with passages like this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And then he mentions in Hebrews 13, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He went on to describe how that works. He said that we may boldly say, the Lord's my helper. I will not fear. I will not fear what man can do to me. He was convinced. And he wanted to share that God was going to be with him. And that when he said, I am going to be with you, that was the case. But there's something interesting about the presence of God that we should not overlook. And that is because of God's presence, Christians can face debilitating illness. They can face terminal illness. They can face their last days. They can face death. They can do it with peace and with confidence about what lies beyond this life and going forward. When Paul said in Philippians, the peace that passes all understandings can guard your hearts and your minds. He gave a descriptor. He said it's through Christ. And as long as we are in the presence, nothing else is going to matter to us. How many times, I, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've used this verse at funerals. How many times have you heard this verse at funerals? Why? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. That's why we can walk through the shadow of death. Because it just doesn't matter. God's on our side. I am certain over the years that I have shared with you the story, in fact, I know I have, of one lady who will always stick in my memory had the most debilitating illness, condition I've ever witnessed. In a nutshell, her upper body was no longer connected to her lower body. And she was bedbound. And, and the pain had to be excruciating. And I never went to see her that she didn't smile at me and tell me it was going to be okay. presence of God. And even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it just doesn't matter. Because He's still with us. There is a song that we sing, and I told you all of our songs today were going to be around this theme. But there's a song that was written in the fall of 1934, attributed in part to Brother L.O. Sanderson, a brother in Christ. And he was working late on a Monday night. In fact, past midnight, he was in his office and he was working. And as he was working, there was this melody that kept going through his head over and over and over again. And it was so unusual for him to be there, it was after midnight, to be there that late that the police finally showed up at his office to see if something was going on. Because they saw his car outside and they saw his lights on and he told them, no, he was still working and he was having trouble because he had something on his mind and he couldn't get back to his work. And he finally did. And before he finished his work that night, he wrote the melody to the song, Be With Me, Lord. But what's really interesting about the backstory of this song is that eight days later, he received a message from T.O. Chisholm, who had written a poem eight days earlier. 
exactly after midnight, the same time that he was writing the medley to be with me, Lord, T.O. Chisholm was finishing up a poem. And when Sanderson looked at the poem, it fit his song perfectly. And as we sing it, pay special attention to verse 3. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unneeded. continue and who knows what its future will be 
But God said, I am the beginning and the end. And so he would never change. That all things would be inherited. That all the things, and an inheritance is something that has been left to us, to those who overcome. The inheritance to receive will be the right to have the inheritance to spend eternity with God in His presence. And as exciting as that picture is of the gold streets and the mansions and the singing and the harps and all of that stuff, don't lose sight of the fact we get to be with the Creator forevermore. And that's pretty special. But there's a warning. And the Scriptures also tells us, what if God's not with us? Well, we are told in Numbers chapter 14 that they had to continue to follow after God. And if Israel refused to to go into the promised land this time. When Joshua told them this, if they had a lack of faith, then they were told that even if they later changed their mind, that initially, and Moses warns them, that if they don't go in, and, and, and you remember when Moses said, you know, we must go in and take it, and the, and the spies came back and said, we can do it, we can do it, and, and they could push back and said, no, we can't. And, the, and they didn't pay attention to the warning of Moses, and now we get back and Joshua has to take them in later. They were instructed by Moses in verse 43 that if you turn away from the Lord, the Lord's not going to be with you. Do we have any reason to believe that that has changed? That God would not be with us? Because when we read about this, the people who will not follow Him, who will not accept Him, who will not serve Him, the Revelator gives us a picture of what happens to them when they're not with us. And these are the people who wouldn't serve Him. These are the people who will receive what Romans talks about as the wages of sin, that is death. In this case, it's the second death that is referred to in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. But there are conditions. The conditions you have to meet. When God told Jeroboam, if you will listen and do all that I command you, and walk in my ways and do what's right in my eyes and keep my commandments, as did David my servant, I will be with you and will build you a sure house, just like I did for David. I will give Israel to you. And Jeroboam ignored it. Because he didn't meet up with the condition that was put upon him. You and I have conditions to meet. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all those that obey Him. There's the condition. Salvation is offered unto us if we obey. But it's an interesting thing to think about. That there are a lot of people out there who would acknowledge God's presence, who would acknowledge God's existence or Christ's existence, who will still be lost. Because Jesus Himself said... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of the Father that is in heaven, that is the one who will get to enter. We have to seek his will. He is our shepherd. Will we follow our shepherd? Have you been obedient? Does it matter to you that if your life was taken from you today, and you have not been baptized, that you read the end result we just showed. Yesterday, a few minutes after 12, we drove off the interstate at the Mount Juliet exit, just about the time that lightning struck a new apartment building, and it burned to the ground. 40 people, 40 families are displaced. But what I didn't know until this morning is when that building collapsed, the firefighter wasn't able to get out. And he is in critical condition. All the families, all of the animals were rescued. But there's still one responder who hasn't made it. What a tragic story. And as all of those who are first responders will tell you, when they are running into situations, their own safety is not part of their thought process. And we know 
any day. We could cross the street and it'd be our last day. Are you ready? Is God with you? It's a sobering question. For God to be with us, we have to do His will. We're going to make Him our shepherd. We have to commit to following the shepherd. Have you obeyed the gospel? We can help you in any way. Please come right now as together we stand and as we sing this song.